Hello, this is Adam Downing with Virginia Cooperative Extension. Welcome to Friday uh, for our 15 minutes in the forest. We're actually not in the forest yet, but we'll be here in a little bit. I uh, work for Virginia Cooperative Extension in the Northern District. And I'm um, actually here in my garage today with a couple of friends, and we are doing shiitake mushroom log inoculation, which is a pretty simple process, and you certainly get a nice product afterwards. So if you're watching this, and you like shiitake mushrooms, give a thumbs up and the, uh, and the like or whatever it is on this YouTube business. But uh, give a thumbs up if you like shiitake mushrooms. And I'm going to start out with talking about the logs themselves. Here we have a, a, a about 38 logs that uh, we harvested about a month ago. Um, these are mostly white oak logs. They work well for the strain of mushrooms, sh the strain of shiitake mushrooms that we're inoculating with. And uh, we cut these logs out of a forest, like I said, about a month ago, and then just put them in a dark, cool place to let them sit. The time of year that you harvest these logs is important in that you want the bark to be tight. Because once you start handling logs in the springtime, then the bark just comes off very easily. In fact, you may have noticed, or perhaps you can take notice, of uh, log trucks going down the road this time of year and some of the logs are completely naked, don't have their bark on at all and that's because the spring sap flow makes the bark very loose and comes off real easily. So we harvested these while the log, the trees are still dormant, the leaves, the buds hadn't started coming out yet at all. Here another uh, couple weeks, so the leaves on the white oak trees will be out and perhaps fully formed in much of the state and the bark will be tight again. So you could be harvesting uh, white oak logs um, again uh, by the time this video plays uh, for shiitake mushrooms. And if you do that, then you want to uh, store those logs for a few weeks because during the growing season especially, they've got antimicrobial uh, or fungal act, um, activity in there that you want to kind of die down so that when you inoculate it with the fungus that you want, in this case shiitake, they'll be able to take it. So I'm um, going to introduce you to the uh, first friend I have here with me, and his name is Charlie Becker. Charlie is with the Virginia Department of Forestry. He's a marketing and utilization specialist, and he's going to uh, talk to us a little bit about the log that he has here and what we're going to do as the first step in inoculating this, uh, getting it ready for shiitake logs. Okay, thank you, Adam. Uh, what we have here, of course, what he mentioned is a white oak log. Uh, the ideal size that we try to get is three and a half to four feet long, so it's fairly easy to handle and usually somewhere anywhere between about three and six inches, seven inches in diameter. And what we tend to do, and we'll drill the holes here, is we try to the holes spaced roughly about six inches apart, and then we rotate it and go down about two inches and split the difference so we get a diamond pattern in the log when we're done. And this helps make sure that the, log, the spawn will run through the log as quickly as possible because the mushrooms don't come out until after the log has been totally filled with the, um, the fungus. All right, great. So uh, uh, Charlie's going to be using a special drill. This is actually an angle iron. I said that once before. The mistake, excuse me, this is an angle grinder, and it has a special bit on it that's uh, set to go a certain depth, and it's very fast speed with, on this machine. So you'll get to watch these chips fly here. All right, Charlie, we're ready. Okay. These alternating holes, a couple inches apart this way, six inches apart this way. It does not have to be exact. The idea is just to get this, uh, this spawn put in all the way around the log in enough uh, frequency that it can kind of occupy that log. So another way that you can drill the holes is just with a simple drill, either you know a battery powered drill or, um, or uh, one that's plugged into an outlet with the same bit. Or you can use a regular bit and just put a marker on. That, of course, is going to be more work. But this is just slower than with the uh, angle grind um, than with the uh, angle grinder. But it would be the same same deal. And if you're just doing enough logs for yourself, then that may be perfectly acceptable. Once those holes are all drilled, then we're going to use the inoculator. This is a thumb action inoculator. There are some also with a bigger palm that you would like that. You can do that with this, but your palm is going to get tired. And the size of this is such that it matches this bit, okay, with depth and with diameter. 
which makes it very handy. You could, of course, do this without the special tools. This just makes it a lot easier and a lot faster. So you see this uh, plunger that uh, comes out will push out the, the plug. So I've got the, uh, the spawn here, which um, the spawn is, um, is a lot of sawdust, actually. Uh, you can see a lump here that I'm breaking up. And this little white stuff, that is the mycelium um, of the fungus, of this particular strain of shiitake mushroom, which this is WW70. Okay, and uh, so here's a nice big chunk of the strain. So anyway, this is all uh, just kind of mixed together with sawdust as the uh, carrier of the matrix. And this uh, plunger, then you would jab it in here. You might want to put this into a plastic container instead of this bag so you don't punch holes in it. This bag is about three pounds and it will um, fill up 20 or so logs. So you just put that in the hole and put, push it in there. I'll show you a close-up of this here in a minute. I'll just go ahead and do these holes. Sometimes they need a little extra push than what uh, your thumb may do, but if everything's working nice, and most often it does, then you just line it up, give it a push with the thumb, and you can see that that is nice and full. You don't want it all the way flush, you don't want it sticking up, because at the, at the next stage when we're waxing it, we want that wax to sit down in there. So we've got three, four holes here done uh, pretty quick with just a simple drill. Uh, this tool, I can't remember how much this costs, but you can buy these from suppliers. Um, and of course, if you wanted to, you could simply take your finger and kind of push it in there. So if you just want to do a few logs uh, and see what it's like, you could, uh, you could go about it that way. All right, so um, next is uh, waxing. We'll take a look at that, and then we're going to head to the woods. Okay, so after we have the log inoculated with the spawn in each hole, we roll it on down the line here, and we're with Charlie again here at the end of the line, where he is waxing each hole uh, with a, it's um, something like a beeswax. Uh, you, you can use different kinds of waxes, but you want a fairly flexible wax. Do not use grafting wax, by the way. We tried that one year, and it did not work well. It's too sticky, too messy. But at any rate, so I'm going to come in close here where you can see this. So this is a, now a wax cover one. Here's one that's not yet covered. It will be as he uh, attacks that line. But the um, we call these daubers. Metal kind of a cotton ball and it's dipped into hot wax here we have this hot wax and kind of a small uh, crock pot and just uh, do that and it dry it uh, kind of hardens up uh, very quickly so it doesn't uh, roll out of there and then we also will do the same thing on the end of the log uh, some people don't do this we do well I'll tell you why I do I do because Charlie taught me how to do this and he does it so here we are uh, going into the forest, so the big question now is after we've inoculated those logs and got those all ready to go is where do we put them? Well, I'm going to get to that in a minute, but I just got to show you this special little thing. So some of you were uh, tuned in or maybe watched the recording of last week's 15 Minutes in the Forest that Jennifer Gagnon did. She talked about early spring bloomers, and the first one she talked about, anyone remember what it was? If you do, go ahead and put it in the chat, and I'll give you a hint. This is pretty late for this to still be on here. What is that? That is a red bud blossom. It's looking a little bit tired now, but I like this. One thing that Jennifer didn't say, and this is just one thing that I've kind of thought of, or actually I think someone told me, but when you look up close at that blossom, doesn't it look like a little hummingbird taking a drink of nectar from the tree? I just think that's beautiful. And, and as Jennifer noted, they are edible, and uh, sometimes I just like to take a strip and pop them in. I've actually never had them on a salad, but uh, certainly would make it look nice and, and add some nice flavor. Okay, so here we are in the forest, and the forest really is the best place to put shiitake logs. Logs, after they've been inoculated, really need to be in a place that is damp and in the shade. Um, so it's easy to find shade you know, in a yard or even right on the on kind of the north side of the house, you know, right up against the house, so it's probably not going to be damp there. And so a forest works best. If you don't have a forest, you can certainly uh, use another space like that, but you may have to soak the logs to get them to bloom. 
Um, and the big thing is you don't want them to dry out very fast. So behind me you can see uh, quite a, a slew of shiitake logs, the two big rows on my left and my right. These were the ones that we just did this year. The ones that are left have sent a lot home with uh, people who have helped and with the landowner who has graciously given us uh, permission to cut the trees down on this place. And so these logs, after they've been inoculated um, and, and the wax put on the ends and covering those holes, they need to just rest for about a year. And the way that they rest is simply lying down on the forest floor. So you don't want them on a muddy spot. You don't want them in a gully where they're going to get mud and, and, and washed, you know, dirt, um, water running over them or whatever. Um, so just on a bed of leaves like you would find on the forest floor is great. Um, then after they rest, then you might want to prop them up like you see here on this tree so that they uh, have more space for the mushrooms to grow. So um, these logs that, uh, that we've done this year, many of them, depending on the size, will probably have some mushrooms this fall. Uh, they won't have any this spring, but the ones we did last year will have some this spring. And in fact, we're going to take a look and see if we can find any uh, right now. <clears throat> it's been uh, wet, but it has been cool, so we're not going to find, we may not find any. This is a big stump that, uh, that I did, uh, let's see, two years ago, I think it is. I put tags on the end of these. Um, so you can see the tags. These were last year's uh, logs. So I can be setting these up this year. And um, we just put the strain of the mushroom and the, the year on it. But this, by the way, is the fungus the the mycelium that's growing throughout this log and you can see kind of some evidence of where the drill the drilling holes are here are what the holes look like from last year so they're kind of falling out here's a stem from a mushroom that was harvested okay um, I don't think we're gonna find oh here's some that are popping out look at that all right so these are just now popping out because of the wet weather we had the past uh, couple weeks it's been cool, so it's taken a longer time to, to get going. But uh, we will have some mushrooms here on this log in a couple of, uh, couple of days probably, depending on the ambient air temperature. So these are some logs that were done. Uh, let's see. These are probably about three years old. And you see they start falling apart. Squirrels will get into them and stuff like that. Speaking of pests with uh, shiitake logs, um, squirrels and slugs would probably be the primary pest, but generally speaking, I have not had too many problems with pests. So, all right, well, that's about all I see, but it's a little early in the season. We've had good weather, but it's uh, been a little bit cool. So again, the main thing is to let some logs rest and uh, take a look at them. You know, if you forget about them, it's not a huge deal. The mushroom will grow, it'll dry out, and if you find it later on, you can still harvest that, you can rehydrate it, and make good use of it. How long will these logs last? Well, that depends on the size, but a log, oh, three or four inches, if you just let Mother Nature do the watering and the, and the fruiting, it will probably last uh, three years, three or four years. Um, if you force the bloom by soaking the whole log and say a kiddie pool or a bathtub or something like that and if you do that on a regular basis then it won't last as long you'll get the same number of mushrooms it'll just be in a compressed time so that's the deal with how long these logs will last it's kind of like they have a depending on the size of the log a certain number of mushrooms that they can produce and you can either compress it by forcing the bloom which is what commercial growers do but for the homeowner the hobbyist um, what I do and what Charlie does is we just let the rains fall when they fall, and then we kind of keep track of things and go harvest those. Which are, when you get a big harvest, it's real fun to share that with friends. So, I want to thank you all for joining 15 Minutes on the Forest. I got one last thing to say. This hat I've been wearing. This is a Sharp Logger hat. I work with the Sharp Logger program, Virginia Cooperative Extension, in partnership with the Department of Forestry. It's a training program for loggers, not to teach them how to be loggers, but to give them some tips on how to be better loggers, safety-wise, stewardship of the resource-wise, and, and just following laws and stuff like that. So 
that's what this hat is about. I'll try to wear a different hat each time I do this segment and uh, give you a little orientation to what Virginia Cooperative Extension does in the realm of forestry and natural resources. And once again, we thank you for joining us. And uh, please come back next week where Jason Fisher will be talking about crop tree management.